Welcome back. We are on chapter five of War Brothers. This one we go back to Jacob and uh, it's called School Days. Ethel watched from the doorway as Jacob packed his tin suitcase. Do you need help? Jacob shook his head. He had been packing his own suitcase since he was six years old. Here, you take this. Ethel dropped a small bag of herbs into his bag. This is for a sore throat. You get them too much. Jacob grimaced. Ethel's potions and concoctions smelled like monkey dung and tasted even worse. Beside his small aluminum case were two stacks of supplies. In one pile, there was a change of clothes, his good shoes, pens, paper, notebooks, and two textbooks father had ordered from Kampala. In the second pile, there was a towel, two bars of soap, one for washing himself, and the big blue bar for washing clothes, a sheet, a blanket, a bucket to haul water with, and a torch. All but the bucket were packed neatly into the case. His mattress was standing near the door and had already been wound up tight with a cord. Jacob stood the bucket beside the mattress. And this is from Bella. Ethel handed him a peke. Jacob tucked it into his case. The peke contained a jar of peanut butter, some ketchup to make the school food edible, and biscuits. This is from me, too. She handed him a small jar of sugar. Now, hurry, hurry. I will walk with you to the bus station, announced Ethel. She was always in a rush. Once outside the house, Ethel swept up the suitcase, planted it on her head, and, in long, even strides, swept out of the compound. Jacob tucked the rolled mattress under his arm, picked up the bucket in his other hand, and followed. Small children gathered around a termite hill taller than he was. They poked strands of hay into the holes. Alive, fried, or even dipped in curry paste, white ants were tasty treats. Jacob stopped under a jacaranda tree to remove a petal from his sandal. When in bloom, the tree would be covered with purple flowers with a sweet smell. He shoved his sandal back on, then had to march double time to catch up with Ethel. The bus looked more like a beast than a machine. It carted 40 or so passengers, plus assorted livestock to the city limits and beyond. The whole back end of it sagged. Where was Tony? No matter, the bus would not leave until the driver had enough occupants to make it worth his while, and so far, it was only half full. The bus driver revved the engine, then hollered to those walking by, Come now, please, I am about to leave. When that didn't seem to work, the driver yelled out the door, If you want home, come now. Still no takers. Finally, the driver thumped down on his seat and cranked the radio up when a Bob Marley song came on. He waited. Jacob's suitcase and mattress were tossed onto the roof of the bus. He kept the bucket with him. There were many seats left inside, but he chose the one behind a goat, because there'd be plenty of room on one side for Tony. He stretched over a fat granny and looked out the window. You will be a good boy this term and make your father proud, Ethel hollered at him. She always said that. She'd even said it when he was six and going off to school for the very first time. Jacob nodded. He would be good, and he would make his father proud. Then he saw someone running. Tony! Jacob bellowed. Tony! With his mattress on his head and a bucket in his hand, stuffed to the top with what little he had, Tony came jogging down the dusty road. Jacob waved frantically. Tony did not have a silver tin suitcase like the other boys. His family could not afford to send him to school. But the nuns in his elementary school believed in him because he was smart and a good boy. They filled out many scholarship application forms. Finally, Tony was allowed to sit the entrance exam to jo George, jo George Jones Seminary for Boys. Tony had told Jacob the story. The nuns prayed and prayed. They told me that if I failed, it was because I was an ungrateful boy. But if I passed, it was God's work. Then they said that if I got into, the, into high school, I should repay God by becoming a priest. At this part of the story, Tony always laughed. He never actually said it to his friends, but everybody knew that Tony really wanted to become a priest. I made it! Beaming, his smile stretched from ear to ear. Tony boarded the bus, mattress and all. The goat nudged Jacob and looked at Tony's mattress with interest. Ethel banged her fist against the side of the bus and said goodbye. 
Jacob leaned across the granny, waved out the open window, then made himself comfy. Three more people climbed on the bus, and there were greetings all around. Finally, with what sounded like a small explosion, the bus was launched and headed off down the bumpy road to great cheers and claps. The small city of Gulu was soon left behind. It was too noisy to talk, so the best he and Hon Tony could do was yell to out to each other occasionally or to sing along with the radio. A ruddy, sandy, potholed road cut a swath through the countryside. Elephant grass, bush, and farmer's fields were all the eye could see. Soon, they would meet up with their friend Paul. Jacob couldn't wait to hear the stories Paul would have to tell. Paul was one of the biggest, Paul was the biggest of the three boys, the best looking and the bossiest. He spoke English and French, plus a Choli and Langi, of course. Though his family lived in Uganda's capital city, Kampala, Paul attended school with Jacob and Tony in northern Uganda because that was where his mother was from. Besides, the schools in the country were cheaper than the schools in the big city, much cheaper. Paul's father worked for an agency that was trying to provide people with clean drinking water. Paul's family did not own land. He was paid for his work, but everyone knew that money was nothing but dust in the mouth. During the school break, Paul's father had gone to America to give a speech about the water quality in Uganda. The people Paul's father worked for so that he could take his son, too. The white people in the office gave him something called airline points, which meant that Paul could get a plane ticket to New York City. It was as close to a miracle as Paul could ever expect to get. The best part about Paul, in Jacob's opinion, was that even though he was from the great city of Kampala, he didn't treat Jacob and Tony like villagers. He didn't laugh at them, just the opposite. When Tony had first come to the school, he tried to turn off a light bulb by touching it and burned his hand. When the other boys laughed at him, Paul threatened to knock all their heads off. They stopped laughing. Two hours later, the bus came to a grinding stop in front of the blue and white sign that read, George Jones Seminary for Boys. The school wasn't just a seminary, of course. Boys who did not plan to become Catholic priests went to the school as well. It was a good place for any boy to get an education. Come on! Jacob grabbed his bucket, pushed the goat aside, said goodbye to the granny, and the two boys scrambled off the bus. This one? A man standing on the roof of the bus held up a mattress roll. Yes, please and thank you, Jacob yelled back. His mattress roll and tin suitcase came hurtling off the roof, landing with a thud and a cuff, cough of dust. They turned and ran through the gates of the George Jones Seminary for Boys. <clears throat> America and Bull's Blood. Sorry, I have a tickle today. Chapter 6. Young guards sporting small guns with wooden handles stood watching the boys enter the school. Were these extra guards his father had asked for? They looked bored, or maybe angry. Certainly, they did not look as though they would, or could, fight off the LRA. One guard in particular glared at the boys with loathing. Jacob understood why. The students at George Jones Seminary for Boys were special, lucky. They would have an education, feed their children, have a sweet, sweeter life. Once through the gates, they saw the familiar square of green grass with a sprawling mango tree planted in the middle. Classes were held under the tree, and students often ate under it too. The grass had been trimmed that very morning. Women from a nearby displacement camp would often come with babies on their backs and cut the grass with long shears. To Jacob's eye, everything looked welcoming. The white and turquoise stucco chapel, which was also the assembly hall, was directly ahead. Classrooms in red brick buildings with big, airy windows were to the left, and a large, one-story building housing three dormitories sat to the right of the open square. Shouts and welcomes greeted them. The air was filled with names and cheers. On the first day of school, everyone was a friend. What took you? Paul as large and gangly as a baby zebra, came out of nowhere and tackled Jacob to the ground. Tony flung aside his mattress and bucket, took a giant leap into the air, and pitched himself on top. Get off! Get off! When they eventually rolled off him, Jacob lay flat out, his whole body convulsing with laughter. He looked up at the sky. School felt like home. Jacob's grin spread from ear to ear as he crawled back onto his feet. Catch! 
Paul flung Jacob's mattress at him. He caught it and fell down again. Boys, enough! Mr. Autumn, the assistant headmaster, took long strides towards them. Dressed in a western-style blue suit, white shirt, and striped tie, he gave each boy a hard stare. Mr. Otum could throw a sour face across open ground like an Olympic athlete could throw a javelin. Paul reached down and yanked Jacob to his feet. Tony banged his head into Paul's butt, then fell over back into the dirt. Paul and Jacob nearly exploded with laughter. Mr. Otum just rolled his eyes and walked away. Hurry, I've already picked out your beds. You have to unpack before prayers. Paul hoisted Jacob's suitcase onto his shoulder. Jacob and Tony picked up their mattress and buckets, and the boys raced all the way to the dorm. There were three dorm rooms at their school. The dormitory building was shaped like a T. All three dorms were connected by a common room at the top of the T. In each of the three rooms, a long line of brown painted iron beds greeted the students. Twenty cots on each side, forty beds to a room. Jacob, Paul, and Tony had been assigned to dorm room number one. The cot Paul had picked out for Jacob was the third on the right, the one closest to the door. Tony, you are in bed number five. He pointed to a spring cot. Paul had cot number four. He liked being in the middle of things. Paul hurled himself onto Jacob's bed springs and bounced up and down, for no reason whatsoever, making a rackety creaking noise. Off! Jacob grabbed Paul's arms and hauled him off the bed springs, then rolled out his thin mattress. Ah, there you are. I have been waiting to talk to you three. It was Mr. Ojok, their Don. He also taught chemistry, mathematics, and algebra, Jacob's best subjects. He had even studied in England. Everyone thought he was a very good teacher. We have a new boy, Okello Norman. Mr. Ojok spoke in what Jacob thought of as his teacher voice. He's younger than the rest of you, only 12, but he has excelled in all his classes. He is here on a full mathematics scholarship. Give, given your interest, interest in mathematics, Jacob, I thought you might make him feel welcome. Mathematics? Jacob frowned. The boy must be good to have won such a scholarship. But how good? Imagine losing the mathematics prize to this, this year to a 12-year-old. Jacob, are you paying attention? Jacob's head snapped up. Yes, sir. Good, because I want all three of you to be responsible for him. See that his first few weeks go smoothly. Three hearts plummeted. That's all they needed to care for. <clears throat> Sorry. That's all they needed to care for a brainy Ongi, and one who would probably cry himself to sleep too, as long as he didn't wet the bed. There was no protecting a bedwetter. Do I make myself clear? Mr. Ojok repeated. Jacob's, Tony's, and Paul's heads bobbed up against their chest. Look up. May I have your word, each of you? Yes, sir. All three boys straightened up and nodded smartly. Mr. Ojok looked down at the clipboard in his hand. There are 38 boys in this dorm. Two more will be joining us in a few days. See that all the new boys are made welcome. And with that, he bustled away, all business. Have you met Norman? Jacob dumped his clothes and shoes into the footlocker at the end of the bed. Tony didn't have much to unpack. A pair of shoes from the UN bag, an extra shirt, and some school supplies given to him by the nuns. No, but I have seen him. Otidi. Paul put his hand mid-chest. Jacob rolled his eyes. Not only was Norman 12 years old, but he was a short 12 years old. So he was going, is that big? That's his bed. Paul pointed to a bed across from Jacob's. But never mind him. We'll be late for prayers if you don't hurry. Paul pressed his face against the iron bars on the windows. The bars had been installed last term to prevent anyone from climbing in. As a precaution, Mr. Ojok had told them all, adding, you boys are perfectly safe here. Paul looked past the mango tree and across the grass to the far building. A line of students had already begun filing out into the chapel. The prefects could cane a boy for being late for prayers, or worse, dispatch him to the kitchen to peel heaps of potatoes. Canning only lasted a few moments, but peeling vegetables, or worse, planting cassava in the school's gardens could take a whole day. The dorm was quickly filling up with boys, all trying to unpack as quickly as possible. 
Paul was getting very impatient. Enough! He booted Jacob's suitcase and bucket under the cot, then yelled, Run! The three boys raced out of the dorm, body checking each other as they went. They barged through the common room at the entrance of the dorm, jostling and nudging each other. Once outside, they raced across the grass, kicking an imaginary football between them. Their laughter mixed with the noise from 150 students as they all tumbled into the chapel. Each made the sign of the cross at the entrance of the pew before shuffling along the row and plopping down on the hard bench. Hands covered mouths as they tried to muffle their giggles. Paul nudged Jacob. Over there, that's him. There was no mistaking Norman. He sat by himself, shoulders slump, eyes riveted on his feet. How did we get stuck with him? Jacob grumbled to Paul. Then he looked around at all the boys, and instantly his spirits picked up. Maybe they were stuck with babysitting a 12-year-old, but it didn't matter. The kid would find his own friends soon enough. This is going to be the best term ever. Father Ricardo, the school's priest, said a prayer. Then, Assistant Headmaster Otim welcomed them all back to the school and introduced Headmaster Haycoop. The headmaster was a formidable man with a bus-sized torso and pushed-in hippo head screwed onto a brick of a body. There were rumors that the headmaster had once been a heavyweight boxer before he'd heard the voice of God calling him to the priesthood, and after that to the seminary. He was almost deaf, so Jacob thought that God must have had to really yell. I have great news, headmaster bellowed. He compensated for not being able to hear by talking a lot and talking loudly. I am happy to announce that the building of our new library will commence immediately with a completion date set for the new year, and the budget will allow us to buy a hundred new books. Headmaster Haycoop paused, allowing the oohs and ahs to subside. Headmaster wasn't finished. George Jones Seminary for Boys exists to produce scholars who will take our great country of Uganda into the future. We must therefore avail ourselves the world's knowledge, both past and present. Knowledge is infinite and waits patiently to be both discovered and rediscovered. And yet, our lives are finite. Headmaster Haycoop's voice began to wobble, as though he might burst into song. Please no, thought Jacob. From our country's long past, which touches creation itself, to our great future, the headmaster stretched out his arms to embrace the air. We, who are in this house of God, have mere moments to determine the truth before we are called back into the welcoming arms of our creator. Now, let us pray. They prayed. They sang. Headmaster Haycoop was the loudest. He was tone deaf and threw everyone off. Paul started to giggle, then Tony, then Jacob, and finally the whole row of boys was shaking with laughter. Headmaster's arms went up and down with the music. The laughter was a fire spreading up and down the rows. Teachers stood up and shot angry glances. But how could one punish an entire school? Some of the boys managed to swallow their giggles, but not all. With the last prayer, led by Father Ricardo, the laughter subsided and the congregation of boys murmured, Amen. Finally, they all sang the closing hymn. As soon as they could, the boys all leapt out of their seats. Paul's and, Paul and Tony... were caught in a wave of students that bunched up at the door, pushing and shoving, calling to each other, laughing, then spilling out of the chapel. Jacob pressed himself against the wall and waited. He might as well say something to the new boy and get it over with. As Norman moved along with the crowd, Jacob elbowed his way towards him. Hi, I'm Jacob. Norman looked up, eyes wide, lips slightly parted, as if he were about to yell or make a run for it. I know he's 12, Jacob thought, but he looks 10, 9 even. And just as Jacob had suspected, there were tears circling in the boy's eyes. You like mathematics? Jacob was almost yelling now as the crowd of boys surged around them. The boy nodded. Know your times tables? Again, the boy nodded, and for a fleeting second, there might have been the hint of a smile. No, it was more of a grimace, as though someone was stepping on his foot. Wait, someone was stepping on his foot. Hi! Tony leapt up and hollered over Paul's shoulder. The two had managed to worm their way back through the crowd. I'm Tony. This is Paul. We hear you are good in math, Paul nudged Jacob. Give him a question. 
It seemed a little mean. Jacob shrugged, but he figured he might as well put this Norman kid in his place as soon as possible. What is 981 times 97? Paul and Tony snickered. Startled, Norman looked up at Jacob. His eyes narrowed. Jacob sucked in air. He's seeing the numbers, he thought. Speaking slowly, his lips barely moving, Norman enunciated one number at a time. Nine, five, one, five, seven. A two ten, Jacob muttered under his breath. Normally, he did not swear. We have a little time jump here. The three boys sat on Jacob's bed with a jar of peanut butter to share. The school's evening meal of potio might have filled their stomachs, but it hadn't left them any less hungry. It was the only thing about school that Jacob really didn't like, the food. Look at him, said Paul. The three glanced over at Norman. Despite only one meager, bald, dim light bulb dangling from an overhead beam in the middle of the dormitory, Norman sat on his bed with his knees up and his head buried in a book. Jacob sighed. They should do something with him, talk to him, maybe, include him. They had promised. We'll take him to class with us tomorrow, suggested Tony. Jacob and Paul nodded vigorously. The idea eased their guilt. They would make friends with the new kid tomorrow. Jacob carried on with his story. So, the two bulls charged at each other, and the head boy yelled so loud that he fell out of a tree. Jacob could hardly finish his tale about school break before convulsing with laughter. Paul had the most exciting story of all. He told them about his father, about how he had stood in front of many important people in America and given a speech. He was obviously very proud of his father, Jacob thought, although he was trying not to show it. Paul didn't want to look like a show-off. None of them did. Tell us about America, Jacob prompted him. Well, in New York City, there is a team called the Yankees. They play a game with a hard white ball and a bat, like cricket, but not at all like cricket. They play at night, but it looks like day. Jacob and Tony nodded their heads, although neither understood. Night was night. How could nights be day? And there are moving staircases, and they eat dogs and buns. And Jacob, your father has many bulls on his farm, but I drank Red Bull in a can. Paul howled with laughter at that. Tony and Jacob sat confounded. Liquid animal juice? Blood? Did Americans drink bull's blood out of a can? And the telephones are attached to the wall with a wire. Wires on a telephone? How could it fit into a pocket? Are American streets filled with wires? Jacob asked. No, there are telephones that are attached to the walls, and they have cell phones too. Paul said all this with great authority, but none of it made sense. Lots of people in Africa had cell phones, lots and lots. But why would Americans need two kinds of phones? Jacob looked at Tony. So what did you do on your holiday? He asked. I read the entire book of Matthew in Italian. Father Ricardo suggested I study Italian. After all, the Vatican is in Rome. Tony stopped, looked down at his hands, and started to mumble. I mean... If I ever went to Rome, it would be... Paul and Jacob plastered perplexed, perplexed looks on their faces, which made Tony stumble even more. Jacob tried not to laugh. Everyone knew that Tony wanted to become a priest. Tony, always last to leave chapel and first to raise his hand in a religious studies class. Did he really think his friends wouldn't know? The peanut butter jar was licked clean, and Paul's crackers, meant to last the whole term, or at least the week, were almost gone before the boys said their prayers and crawled into bed. Some of the door, some of the boys in the dorm wore night clothes, although most, like Tony, wore their school shirts and shorts to bed. The prefect flicked off the overhead light, and the humming generator outside the barred window was instantly silence. The lock on the door clicked. The boys were locked in to prevent them from running off in the night to the girls' convent's, convent school a few kilometers down the road. That's what they were told, although not once had Jacob known anyone to do such a thing. There was a deadbolt on the door inside, too, but no one bothered with it. Jacob lay in the dark, hands behind his head, and thought that he couldn't have been happier. Once, old Bella had said that cooking made her happy because it allowed her to share her happiness. It was true, he thought. A person could be content alone, maybe even at peace, but happiness was only real if it was shared. Someone farted. 
The dorm erupted in laughter. Put it back! Put it back! Yelled someone down the row of beds. Then, another voice in the dark. Farts can't be caught! The whole dorm roared with laughter all over again. The prefects didn't barge in and turn on the light. Even the prefects this year were great. It took a while for everyone to settle down again. Paul! Jacob whispered across the space between their two beds. What was it like to fly in the air across the ocean? I was scared, very scared, but I did not want to embarrass myself, so I did what my father did. What is the food like in America? Tony leaned out of his own bed. Very bad. It tastes like dust and comes in packages. Jacob was not surprised. People from America, Canada, and even England and Australia sent food over to Africa that tasted terrible. He thought that maybe they only sent the food that they refused to eat, but maybe their food really was terrible. Maybe they did not know how to cook. But many American people are very fat, said Jacob. He had seen many pictures, and he wasn't being mean. He admired fat. If their food is so bad, why are they so big? They eat a great deal of the bad food, and there is much food available. It's hard to explain their markets that they call super. Paul's voice faded for a moment. I think that even when they are full, they eat. That was all he could think to say. Do they all eat twice a day? Tony's voice rose up in amazement. More than that, maybe three, four, five times a day. They call it snack, he said quietly. What is snack? asked Tony. They were taught English, but none of them had come across such a word. I do not know, said Paul. None spoke for a moment. Do they all smell sweet? Despite his amazement, Tony could not stop his questions. Even the black people in America smell white, laughed Paul. Jacob, who was listening intently, flopped back on his mattress and stared at the ceiling and tried to picture the sweet-smelling fat people, telephones attached to walls and wires hanging out of pockets. The full moon shining through the barred windows cast stripy lines on his bed. Smiling, Jacob drifted off to sleep. It was two o'clock in the morning when the entire dorm awoke to the sound of gunshots. Well, that's where we're going to leave off for right now. I'll uh, get the next chapter ready for you.